Johnstone, and Chris Davis is with Red Siren. Uh, if you have ever wanted to use your Sadie game box as an attack tool, I think these guys can help you. Thanks. <laughs> How's everybody doing today? Excellent. Well, there was at least a couple of responses. That's uh, better than most. Um, welcome. Good morning. Uh, welcome to DC Phone Home. Welcome to Vegas. You're welcome to Vegas. Uh, hope you guys had a good flight. Um, for those of you that were traveling, my name is Chris Davis, as uh, Paul said a moment ago. I'm a CIS, but I work for Red Siren. Um, mainly, I do penetration testing, vulnerability assessments. Um, I'm in charge of the penetration testing team at Red Siren. Um, been working in InfoSec for going on five years now, in IT in general, nine, ten, who knows? It's hard to keep track. Um, the, uh, we want to talk about some stuff that we've been developing uh, over the past, what, two months now? <laughs> right. We, it, it's, we're right on the line here, so we're hoping we're going to give you guys a good presentation. Okay, and my name's uh, Aaron Higby. I'm a CISP as well. Chris and I actually took the horrible test together. He finished before me, however. I work for uh, Foundstone as part of their professional services organization, and mostly I do attack and penetration testing for our clients there out of the DC office. Chris and I actually were co-workers at Lucent Technologies not too long ago as part of their professional services organization. And well, uh, Lucent isn't doing so well, so we've both kind of gone our separate ways, but we've continued to uh, uh, work on security projects together uh, like this one today. Um, as I mentioned, I do mostly attack and penetration testing, and commonly I'm involved with uh, mimicking the insider threat or going inside and uh, seeing what type of access that I can get. And uh, not too long ago, I was doing this type of work for a client, and what they wanted me to do, that I had access physically inside, but they wanted to see if I was able to actually get into the data center. They had that locked with a card key access, and I didn't have access to that. So one night I stayed, stayed late and I always heard about the idea of crawling over the ceiling tile. So I thought, well, that sounds like a great idea. Let me try that, eat, right? That sounds pretty easy. So I walked around the perimeter and I found the storage uh, room that I could get into that shared a wall with the data center. So uh, I'm looking around for some chairs and some desks and I ended up actually putting a Willy chair on top of a desk, which I do not recommend. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I did okay. I got the first ceiling tile open and I was able to, to reach f over and grab the other one and look down into the race floor data center. So I'm like, great. Well, now I had the problem of actually getting over that wall and I knew that, you know what, I might be able to get over but there's no way I'm coming back. And I, not, this, not through the ceiling anyway. So I jump through and I break two of the client ceiling tiles on the way in. Uh, which I was pretty embarrassed about, and there's no, I'm not gonna be able to cover my tracks after that one. So, but I, I, I'm inside the data center, it's pretty late, so no one's there. So my next chore is we're finding some server that's valuable that uh, they would like to see in their report. So after walking down rack upon rack, I think I find the payroll and accounting server, and uh, meanwhile, about five or 10 minutes have passed just to find this server. Then I finally uh, think I located it. I spent another 10 or 15 minutes trying to figure out their convoluted KVM just to get a login prompt. Mind you, I wasn't able to bring my laptop or anything, just myself. So basically, the only option that I had was leaving my business card on the server and then putting it in the report, like, okay, I was able to obtain access, sorry about the ceiling tile. Uh, the business card is, is over here just to see that it is possible. Uh, what I wished is I had something that gave me, gave me more access for a limited amount of time. That's, that's actually, you, took, you uh, left business cards, I took business cards as well as a couple other things that the client wasn't too happy about. Um, the, uh, don't worry, I gave it back, really. Um, the, I was in a similar situation doing a physical pen test for a bank uh, back in May. Um, this, this bank was lo locked down tight. I had to get in the data center, I had to get past four access points just to get in there. Uh, your data watch cards, your receptionist, your biometrics. Well, with a little bit of impersonation and a little bit of uh, social engineering, I was able to actually get past three of the checks and into the, the, the work area where most of the uh, employees sat. Wasn't able to get into the data center, but um, I was, while I was in the, in the work area, I was walking around, went through their knock, looked at, uh, looked at how they did business, walked up to a sales guy's computer, t screen totally unlocked, played around for a while, um, took a business card and a personal effect from his desk just to prove that I was there. Uh, but 
you know, I was kicking myself in the butt because uh, Aaron and I were working on this project. We had pretty much just started when I had done this test, and if I had had just something I could have left there, uh, something that I could have dropped in that system, loaded some software, and then went home and just hacked, you know, just had a tunnel waiting for me, had something waiting for me at home that gave me the data, gave me the access uh, I needed. That would have been, that would have been awesome. Um, so that's basically what we're going to be talking about today is what, uh, what we've developed in terms of theory and actual uh, devices uh, of what we're calling 180 degree hacking. It's also, we also refer to it as phone, phone homing, um, coming from the DC phone home, kind of like ET phone home. Uh, phone home box is even called the mothership. Um, we've developed it on a few different platforms. As you can see, the Dreamcast is one of them. Uh, we've used a compact iPack a handheld to do it. It's small. It's, it's easy to use. Um, we also made a bootable CD-ROM because, well, everybody's got a PC, uh, so why not use it? We also want to show you guys ha that it actually works, um, and uh, as well as maybe suggest some uh, remedies for that. Uh, just uh, so you all know, for a point of reference, we will have a copy of the presentation on the website, as well as a link to all the tools that we've used, so you don't have to write down uh, uh, everything that we say. But uh, if you do go to the website, we're going to have links to the distribution for the Sega Dreamcast, for the Compaq iPack, and as well as the x86 bootable CD. Uh, there's just some brief assumptions. This is the, the deep knowledge track, so we're assuming everyone is familiar with Linux, uh, general network architecture, uh, networking, uh, basic uh, hacking tools, port scanning tools, uh, and other uh, different uh, security models, VPNs, proxy servers. Now, to describe what exactly we're attacking with, it, with this concept, um, we're going to breeze through a couple slides showing, what, showing the architecture we're attacking. Conventional enterprise security. Most people have graduated to a firewall, thank God. And they're using network address translation on the inside, private addressing schemes. They hopefully have a DMZ for their, uh, for their public-facing servers. Um, some companies are starting to, to upgrade their services to, to more defense in depth type te te techniques where you're using an IDS, um, where you are giving remote access with strong authentication to administrative personnel coming in from the outside, using proxies and data caches. Uh, the, they're, checking their email for uh, viruses, but of course, I, I guess most of you know that uh, changing an EXE to a TXT works just fine. Um, they're hiring security personnel to watch their, their network full time. Um, they're also hiring consultants uh, to come in and advise as to how to make it even better. But all of this combined, in, in our experience, we've found that focusing on the outside is what organizations do. They focus on the perimeter. And that leaves us to believe that these networks have a hard, crunchy outside and a soft, chewy center. And we find this true with most of our clients. There's, a lot, of, there's a lot of emphasis on the perimeter and keeping the bad guys out and keeping the data that's valuable safe within is, uh, is where the focus is lacking. Okay, so what's the problem with that? There's, uh, the problem is people need to use the internet. People at your organization have to get out. They have to do research. So uh, the networks go both ways. Even though you have a firewall on your perimeter, the fact that data can leave the network is, is a key component here. Uh, even hackers, for the most part, seem to be focused on the external, the one vulnerable service that will get them in uh, so they can do ingenious things like set up where servers or uh, IRC bots. But the, most of them are, are, are looking for the one way in from the external side. Uh, so the people are employing firewalls, and mostly firewalls are there to enforce the policy of what services are allowed into the network, uh, which services are allowed into the DMZ, uh, and occasionally they, uh, they set up firewall rules to limit traffic on the outside, but they can't restrict all the traffic, only some. Uh, proxies. Proxies are mostly in place as a network enhancement piece or a piece to, to make people's uh, internet bills a little bit uh, cheaper. Um, some can do uh, content filtering, uh, but the problem with web proxies is the complexity of the web itself and how many protocols actually travel on port 80. It makes it really difficult to do some type of granular checking to see what, what is actually going over your proxy is really web traffic. Uh, currently at uh, w3, w3c.com, there's 30 other web standards that are in development to make web even more complicated than it already is. And you actually think proxy vendors are going to support all those that haven't even been decided on? There are just too many variables present. Um, network intrusion detection. 
again, most companies, even though you could do your multi-layered, even though you could do your multiple points of presence, they're focused on, most companies that I've been to, they, they put one in their DMZ and they're like, that's good enough, we've got an IDS. Um, but really, what's that checking? That's checking from the outside in. That's checking things passing your firewall, your router. Um, IDSs are also limited in the fact that they're signature based, uh, much like a virus checker. You know, if the attack does not have a signature in the database, you're not necessarily going to get an alert to that. Um, some companies are claiming they have anomaly protocol detection, but by definition, an, an anomaly is undefined. So I asked them how they define that exactly. Um, I'm still undecided on whether or not this stuff's actually legit. Um, the no. Okay, so what's the problem with the soft chewy center and, and, the, and the fact that we let most traffic out? Well, for the most part, we believe that the traffic that's leaving our network has been initiated by someone who's supposed to be there, someone who has a card reader, someone who is do, supposed to be doing legitimate work. Uh, companies need their employees to use the internet, uh, and for the most part, we have a, an idea that outside traffic coming in is bad, but everything else leaving the network is good, and that physical security is good enough to uh, make sure that that, uh, that, that uh, malicious traffic isn't originating from the inside. Another problem that we run into for internal security is the concept of the, a computer. Many clients will have secure build procedures for their Unix host or for their NT hosts, but as we'll see from uh, Felix's talk, the, the, there's other hosts on the network that can be uh, equally as dangerous as the Unix systems and as the NT systems and as the user's desktops. So many things these days are, are powerful enough embedded systems or have computers in them that not only can they potentially be abused, but uh, they are being abused. One semi-amusing security advisor, I don't know if I would call it that, that I read two or three weeks ago, uh, some researchers decided that uh, the Xbox is the next grievous thing to hit the internet, and there was this big advisory about how this Xbox may potentially uh, contribute to distributed denial of service attacks. And I got done reading that, and I thought to myself, Wow, that's got to be the most boring, unimaginative use of a computer on someone's network. Uh, you, you have all these network or these these computers deployed in someone's Xbox, and the best thing that we can come up with is to take down eBay. I don't think so. There's there's more that can be done with something like that. So now that we've set the stage, um, telling you guys what what we're what the architecture is we're attacking, some of the uh, some of the problems we see with that architecture, going to get into 180 degree hacking. Big concept around this is why even hack the network? Why not just bring it home to you? Um, that way, you can bypass all those all those devices, uh, all those security devices, fairly easily. The um, it's based on a, a few key points here. Um, one, firewalls are worthless. I'll get back to that in point in a minute because I'm sure some of you uh, might disagree with me. Two, it's based on a delivery mechanism, either physical delivery using a, a known exploit, a zero-day exploit. It's based on the internet, because you have to be able to get the data from one point to another. Hopefully you don't buy a leased line for this purpose. Um, and, second, and last of all, it's based on being able to con people into doing things that they think is simple, they think is you know, harmless to do. Okay. The, uh, now, firewalls are worthless, firewalls are pointless. In the context of this attack, in 180 degree hacking, it, they're transparent. We, the, the whole purpose of the attack is to take advantage of protocols that you allow out, out of your network, take advantage of protocols such as DNS, such as SMTP, such as your HTTP traffic, your uh, SSL traffic, um, things that, that you're saying, okay, this is fine, this is the idea, that's great. We take advantage of that to run, to run a virtual network over. Um, like Chris said, uh, physical access is imperative, and it really is easy to obtain. That might seem uh, you, you may not believe me, but seriously, it's not that hard to get into an organization for one to two minutes tops. I mean, think about it. How, how long do you think a guy dressed in all black with Doc Martens and a ponytail and lots of piercings could probably stay in an organization before they're actually kicked out? Uh, probably they could get in for at least five, one to five minutes. And what I've found from doing this type of work is you're really only limited to your creativity on ways to get into buildings. Okay, so we're going to try to break it all down for you uh, in the simplest uh, uh, way possible so you can kind of get an idea for exactly how this works. By the way, these slides were, uh, these drawings were, you, we used uh, Visio 2003, it's a beta edition, so. Okay. Um, so, you guys. right here is where our black hat lives. 
And it's interesting that the internet goes into his window, but <laughs> I don't know about that. So the way this attack works is he leaves his house and he walks to your company, okay? Then he goes into your front door, past your IDS, past your firewall, past, uh, past your DMZ, and onto your internal network, and he does this without sending a single packet. And that's why this is called the super stealth method. <laughs> You'll never see it if you're watching your IDS. That's right. Okay, so now the black hat, he's a, he's a little uh, timid. He's a little scared. He doesn't want to go inside. He's afraid he might get caught. So what he does is he walks out of his house, the internet's still out of his window, and uh, he goes to the mailbox, and he puts in something to deliver to the people over here, okay? Now here's the, the postal guy, and he's gonna give it to Bob and, and marketing and Joanne and sales, and of course they're gonna wanna put this CD in their computer because it's shaped like Elvis. And if I got, a I got a CD and it was Elvis, I would definitely put it in my computer. So here's uh, Bob in marketing looking at his cool Elvis CD, and he's putting it in his system. Uh, one, of the, one of the common ways of, of getting past uh, physical security uh, is taking advantage of people's weaknesses, namely how kind they are. Um, if, if you can form camaraderie with someone, then, they, then they're more trusting of you and they want to let you, you know, they, wanna, they don't want to necessarily say no, they want to say yes. And uh, <clears throat> one of the easiest ways to do this is take advantage of, uh, of smokers. Um, personally, I'm a smoker. Uh, you know, I found that, you know, the, uh, we're trampled on, we're kicked out of bars. You know, out in LA, people come up and cough in your face, tell you you're evil. And so when we find one of our kind, it's really comforting. And so, <laughs> as you can see here, our, uh, our little black hat walks up to the, uh, to the smokers area outside near the dumpsters. Um, that's where we're always put. And uh, we, uh, we, we form a friendship, we form a bond. And when we're done, at, after having a nice conversation and smoking a few butts, we, uh, they, let, they let us right in the door. Yeah, they give you a cigarette, they give you a light, and they open the door. Very nice people. <laughs> the other way to take advantage of people's kindness is to be in distress, uh, need help. Uh, sort of uh, entice them to help you out. And the uh, one way you can do is carry a big box, as labeled there, uh, through the, and somebody will definitely say, oh wow, you need some help. That looks really heavy, even though it's full of uh, air. And they'll open the door. Or it has a right Dreamcast through. inside. Oh yes, the Dreamcast. Uh, other way to do it, some, some organizations have a policy where they require or they encourage their employees to actually confront individuals that they don't know, they, they've never seen before, and ask who they are, let me see your badge, are you, you know, do you work here? Well, if you're talking on your cell phone, it would just be mighty rude of that person to interrupt you, especially if you're in a very big rush to get to an important meeting with the CEO that you've already researched online. Okay, so let's say none of the physical access is work. You can always rely on the zero-day exploit. There will always be something, a Trojan horse that can be mailed in, or some vulnerable service that you can use to send something that would build a network back to you. Uh, and, and, and hopefully this attack is a little more creative than, uh, than just uh, setting up egg drop bots. So, after we deliver this device, be it a CD-ROM, be it a piece of hardware, after we've plugged it in, we leave. And what does it do? It, one, sits there and tries to, and discovers the network. You can do this through a variety of ways, just use your imagination. Your DHCP, you can do passive sniffing of the network, try to figure out the net mask. You can do ICMP pings for the, for the, uh, for the network and net mask. Once it does that, it's on the network, it knows its default route, it tries to get out of the network on various ports. It goes to common sites such as Google, such as Yahoo, such as uh, you know, commonly used DNS servers. It tries to establish communication with those servers. If it, if it can do it, great, you're out of the network. Um, once it does that, it goes through an analysis process in which it can de determine, okay, well I can get out on these ports, let's go ahead and phone home using one of them. There are similar concepts used in various various uh, applications that are out there now, although not as comprehensive as what, what we're doing today. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing essentially establishes a, a full network. You don't necessarily have your TCP IP stack, but you do have you know, file transport, streaming capabilities, um, you know, chatting, whatever you, whatever you need. There's uh, AOL Instant Messenger. It will actually automatically try to figure out how it can get out. If it can't get it out to 5190, it'll try port 80, tunneling over HTTP. If it can't get out there, it'll look for your proxy. Easy enough. Um, there also, there's also a, a wonderful new uh, thing. It's, it's VNC with a bow on it. 
Um, go to my PC, has a, a software you can download, install it on your computer, it'll tunnel out over uh, 443, over your HTTPS port, and actually establish a, uh, a VPN with its server. Now you go home after doing this, you go home from the office, you go, you log into the site, and all of a sudden there's your desktop. It, it's, it's a wonderful little toy. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about exactly how this occurs, especially on our platform here. Uh, we chose DHCP because you know, most networks run DHCP. So when one of these devices are, are plugged in, the first thing it does is try to get an IP address, simple enough. Uh, the next thing it does is it tries to enumerate outbound traffic. It figures out which traffic it can get out to on the internet. So we chose some key ports that most people let one or two of them out. Uh, we try to uh, contact Google on port 80. Uh, we try to contact Google on port 443. Uh, we try uh, some DNS servers on port 53. A lot of times people let out DNS traffic. Uh, we try ICMP type uh, 0 and 8 to see if pings get out. Sometimes uh, administrators like to let their users ping. It's a helpful network tool. Uh, and other ports that sometimes get out of firewalls, port 20, port uh, 21, 25. Uh, once it can figure out exactly which traffic it can enumerate, it can get out on, it will write the results to uh, a text file, dcph.info.txt, that gets processed later. So this is the part where it gets processed. So the network discovery and the enumeration is, has completed. So the next process that gets kicked off where the text file is analyzed. And it basically goes from left to right. If it can get out on port 80, then, it, uh, then the answer is yes. It'll start VTUN. It'll tunnel home right away. If it can't, but it can get out on port 443, then the same thing will occur. It'll start VTUN and it'll tunnel home. If it can't get out on those TCP ports, it'll, see, it'll check the file to see if it was able to get out on UDP uh, 53 for DNS. And if it was able to do that, then it'll start site and just start, start a VPN back to the phone home machine. If site doesn't work, then it'll see if ICMP was available. And if ICMP is left out of the network, it'll do a VPN uh, network stack over ICMP home. If none of these things are available, let's say this network is really locked down, that they only allow access out via a proxy server, then it starts, kicks off the final process, process which is called the proxy finder. Very uh, creative name. So proxy finder, uh, basically what it does is it uh, does a local zone transfer of the domain name that it enumerated uh, earlier, uh, and it puts that in a text file, all the DNS names that it can resolve. And maybe uh, zone transfers internally are locked down. I don't see that very often, but let's, just, let's say that they are. Uh, then it'll try to do a reverse lookup on the entire range using the DNS servers that the DHCP server gave it. Uh, then it'll put that in a the file. Then it basically just grips. It grips for things that we name our proxies. Uh, proxy, PXY, gate, squid, cash flow, you name it. We have a list of common proxy names that we got off of proxy lists on the internet uh, that it will grip for. It'll put that in a potential proxy list and then it'll port scan those on known proxy ports to see if it can get out to the internet uh, with those proxies. And if it can get out to the internet that way, then it puts that in a, okay, this is an okay proxy. And at that point, it'll start HTTP tunnel, which is tunneling over the proxy. It'll have SSH inside of that, and it'll have PPP inside of that, making a full VPN through the proxy server back to the phone home machine. And if none of that works, then it's a sad face, and you go someplace else. So now we're going to talk about the, the things that we've developed, uh, the, the delivery types that we've developed so far. Um, we've got drop and go hardware, we're going to be talking about that. We've got a bootable CD-ROM that's software based, sort of hardware, I suppose. Um, remote exploit is a possibility, but we didn't really focus on that. We just mentioned it because, well, it's a possibility. Um, moving on to the Dreamcast architecture. Why we picked a Dreamcast, we don't know. We really, really, really wished we did not pick the Dreamcast. It but is the project is named DC Phone Home, so we're stuck with it. But it works. We can't make it like PS2 Phone Home. No. Um, the, uh, well, one of the reasons, and this was the initial reason before we actually tried, uh, tried writing any code for it, um, was it's innocuous. It looks like a toy. It is a toy to most people. Um, if you bring it into a company, they're going to say, wow, look at the toy. And they're not going to think, wow, look at the attack tool. Wow, this thing's going to hack our network. <laughs> they don't know it's the axis of evil. It is the axis of evil. Um, the uh, other nice thing about it is it's really cheap. They don't make them anymore. You can get them on eBay for cheap. 
um, under 100 bucks. If you're going into some place and dropping off a piece of hardware, you don't want to lose a lot of money. You don't want to lose $1,000, $2,000 on a nice laptop that you uh, made for this purpose. It has a broadband adapter. That's what they call it. It's really just Ethernet. Um, it's got a pretty powerful processor, and there was, a, you know, there were rumors at the time of Linux, somebody porting Linux to it. The uh, architecture is based on Hitachi's SH series of, of uh, core processor. The HP Jornada series of handhelds uses the same processor, and so the nice part about it is that once we develop on it here, we're going to, and after the conference, of course, we're actually going to try to put it on the HP Jornada, see if it works. Probably won't, though. Um, too different of a, it's the same, but somewhat different. The Dreamcast, though, limited to a whopping 16 meg of RAM. Um, it, it has a CD-ROM, no writable storage whatsoever. You will burn through, I, I think I burned through about 150 CDs trying to get this thing working, because every time I tried to try something new, it was a new burn. Um, used as a Realtek Ethernet adapter, widely supported under Linux, no problem getting that working. And it also has a keyboard, which made it handy to, uh, no pun intended, I guess. Um, when we actually, we had to actually build the distribution. There was a distro available, uh, but once we started playing with it, we found out that whoever had done it had made a Linux distribution that runs X and runs a video game system em emulator. Tell me the logic in that. Um, the, uh, so we had, to, there, there was a group from shlinux.org that uh, had put together some RPMs. They're actually keeping up development. And maybe once every nine months, they'll release something new. Um, we had to make cross-compiling toolchain. It's, it's impossible to compile anything natively in there unless, you, unless you're really compiling Hello World. I'm not joking. Um, we had to patch the kernel, even though the kernel does have, two four kernels do have SH port. They're not up to date, and we also needed some proprietary, well, not proprietary, but specific Dreamcast extensions to that. Go ahead. The compact iHack architecture. Um, it's, we use the 3765 model. It's now been discontinued, but hey, it's cheap again. Uh, it's got a strong ARM processor, widely supported under Linux, been supported since the 2.2 kernels. It's got 64 meg of RAM, lovely, much better than the 16 meg in the Dreamcast. 32 meg flash ROM, you can get a dual slot PCMCI adapter for it, where you can stick two of the cards in there. Um, also had USB serial. It was just a lot nicer of a platform to work on, since we have to choose one. Um, like I said, it's got a lot of support. Handhelds.org, uh, there are a lot of developers working on putting Linux on these handhelds, which is, which is just wonderful. There are a few distributions uh, available for, for the IPAC in particular. Um, we started with Familiar 052 and went from there. We did have to add some things, but not too much. It was pretty capable in the first place. And also, the nice thing about it, we could compile stuff on this platform. Okay, we realized not everyone's got a spare Dreamcast or a spare iPad laying around. Uh, so we just said, well, what else can we put this on? And uh, we thought, well, hey, how about an x86 bootable CD? So basically, you can go to any PC in an organization, drop it in the drive, turn it on, power it on, and it would send an encrypted uh, uh, network back home. Uh, we thought Trinex would be a great platform to uh, work with. Uh, it's, it's originally meant for uh, floppy disks, but someone has put a small ISO package together. Um, it supports virtually all hardware that Linux supports. Uh, the distribution that we put on, we made sure that there's all the PCMCIA uh, uh, modules that you'll need for your laptops. Um, it's a uh, 20 meg ISO. Uh, we, we, we were asked to provide tools for everyone to put on the CD, and the uh, development for the Dreamcast is quite large. That's why we're keeping that off site. Same with the iPad, but we were able to put this 20 meg ISO on your Black Hat CD. So, what we're encouraging everyone to do is to go to their home or office and burn the CD and put it in and see what happens. Please play with it. <laughs> Please. And we'll let you know if it phoned home. Just, well, I, I, actually, we didn't, we didn't make a phone home version, but what we did do for everyone so they can see if this, this actually works on their network or if it can find their proxy, uh, we did do a, a one that, that, that does all the enumeration of the outbound traffic and will spit out a report and will let you know which traffic it can talk to the internet on, but it doesn't actually phone home. Uh, fair warning, it does contact Google on port 80 and port 443, contacts Earthlink uh, on uh, port 25, I'm sure they're, they're pleased of that. It does contact uh, CSE's DNS server. and. Um, 
It will try to do zone transfers on your internal DNS servers. So if they're external from your DHCP server, be aware that this will try to do a zone transfer. And it'll do a reverse lookup on all of the hosts in, on your internal network. So this is something that you can uh, uh, take home, burn, try it out for, your, for yourself. Uh, on the website, we're going to have uh, uh, directions on building your own uh, DC phone home CD and how to set up your server to accommodate the VPN tunnels that would come to you. Uh, it runs a 245 kernel. There was a lot of packages already available for Trinix, such as Nmap and Netcat and many of the tools that we had to use to, to make this work. Uh, so uh, basically, it became a scripting uh, exercise. We did have to uh, statically compile a few binaries. Uh, we put some other neat tools on there, like uh, Felix's uh, FOSS scanner, which we found works better than DSNF. So we put that on there just for, for, for the purpose of, of education. Um, some of the other tools that are on the CD are just basic uh, network mapping tools, Nmap, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But more so, we're focused on the tunneling tools, which were somewhat more difficult to get on. A lot of them are kernel-based. Um, but we have VTUN, uh, SIPE, HTTP tunnel, ICMP tunnel, S tunnel, PPP, and SSH. Uh, we also added at the last minute a, uh, a tool called Proxy Tunnel, which is proxytunnel.sourceforge.org. And uh, we actually like that a lot better. And for our lab purposes today, the x86 will be uh, using Proxy Tunnel. Uh, and then just a uh, grab bag of other tools to make, make it all come together. Um, the, the concept of phoning home, okay, here it is simplified. It's delivered. A device, whether it's the iPack, whether it's the Dreamcast or a bootable CD, it boots, it gets on the network, it figures out which traffic it can get out on, and then it tunnels home, it phones home. So enough telling you what it does. Let's see if we can uh, get this to work. Now, about 11 o'clock last night, we decided it would be a good idea to uh, make sure it still works. We knew it worked back in Virginia. But uh, we wanted to make sure it still worked. Well, it did it. So Chris went out, and he asked everyone that he could find, can I please borrow your laptop? Because our firewall here exploded and didn't, uh, didn't uh, turn on. So we really want to thank David Litchfield, who's giving a, a speech tomorrow about Definitely SQL. Go see him. Uh, he saved us. We were able to rebuild this firewall and get it, get it working again. Uh, the moral of the story is bring two of everything. I can't stress that enough. Sometimes three, if you can. Right. So uh, uh, we're, we're, we have a, just a quick rundown of what we have set up here. I'm going to be the victim host um, on the internal network. I'll be dot .200. Um, Chris, he's going to be, he's gonna be uh, the phone home box, or the mothership, if you want to call it that. Uh, and, and this will be our corporate network here. They have a firewall. They have private addressing. Uh, they do have a proxy server. Uh, it's a squid proxy server in this case. And they, they do their own internal DNS. And uh, what we're going to do is, is try to demo all these, uh, these platforms for you. And uh, hopefully they work. Hopefully. OK, the first one that Chris is going to set up, and your, your screen's blank there, I know it is. Um, will be the Dreamcast. And the firewall is set up to basically, how a lot of firewalls are set up, unfortunately, allow outbound traffic, but nothing in. Uh, um, it allows outbound port 80 unrestricted. Um, so it's going to boot up and go over that discovery process. I wish we had more um, projectors for each one of these because uh, the booting process of the Dreamcast won't be all that exciting. But uh, we, maybe you'll be able to hear it seeking its CD. If we can go ahead and take a pause just very briefly to get this, to get this set up. Um, apologize for the wait. You know, hope you guys don't get bored.
all you got to look for is the ping response, <laughs> and that's just going to be the, the, you know, you, you know, you know how it works. <clears throat> right now, I'm setting up the server side. We're gonna we're gonna test the Dreamcast first. We're gonna test it running over port 25 over a VTON session. Uh, VTON relies on the kernel ton tap driver, and so it actually runs uh, in user space and types things through there. So it's fairly fairly simple to do. However, we're talking about the Dreamcast here. So we're hoping. Okay. Is it ready? So you just turned it on. I'm powering it on. Would you say that someone who's NetPlus could do this attack? NetPlus certified. Let me start from the beginning. Okay. <laughs> you take it into the network, right? You plug it in. You have to make sure that the power cord goes in right. Yeah, other, if you get it backwards, it kind of won't work. So, and then you power it on, and the light comes on, right? Put it down, and you walk away, and hopefully everything else will happen, just like magic. What I may do just for, I don't know what, is ping it so we can see when it actually boots, and we know when our tunnel is supposed to pop up. Okay, it's booted. Hopefully you guys can hear this. Uh, Dreamcast is that it, the CD-ROM spins and makes noise? Uh, I guess not. Oh, well. <laughs> it's that stealth. Can't even hear it. We are going to have question and answer session afterwards, so if uh, you guys have questions, uh, don't write them down. Try to forget them as quickly as possible. Um, no, we'll, we'll have plenty of time. Is it there yet? Uh, it's still booting. Okay. As you all know, the seek time on CD-ROM drives is I long time. I think it's 2x on the Dreamcast. Ooh. If it doesn't work, we blame the laptop entirely. <laughs> Not this laptop. See if you can ping the dot one hundred now. That one's hold on. Just just ping it. Yeah. That's me. Oh no, dot two hundred, sorry. Wouldn't you know the most simple of the attacks? Well, while Chris works on that, I'm going to prepare for the Trinex CD. Okay, now 
Now what we're going to see here is we've got a virtual network where we're using the 10 dot network. As you can see from our diagram, uh, the public network is the 63.63/8 network. The private network is 172.16.101.0/24. That's me. I'm the victim. Right. That's the victim network. <clears throat> right now, I'm on the public the public network, and I establish a tunnel through the between 10.0.1.2 and 10.0.1.1. This box is 1.1. I'm going to ping 1.2. We have ping responses. We're getting through. However, if I try pinging, hold this one second. At this point, it, the Dreamcast is also running SSH. So if you wanted to SSH into it, you, you, you very well could by just SSHing to the virtual IP. SSH doesn't work on this one. Yeah. Right now, he's trying to uh, to ping me. As, as you can see from the here, like you have two mics, dude. Give me my mic back. All right. Um, <laughs> as you can see, we've got pings. We're pinging the 172 network. This firewall is doing complete NAT translation from the inside out, so nothing should be able to get in. So this guy, this guy is forwarding all the traffic, and he is our gateway into this internal network. So that was the most basic way. It's a VTON over port 25, which was let out of the network. Now what we'd like to do is turn it up a notch a, a little and make the firewall more complicated. And uh, what, we're gonna, what he's going to do is he's going to not allow out 25. He's, gonna, he's not going to allow any TCP for that matter. He's only going to allow out UDP. And this is where we're going to uh, demo uh, the, uh, the IPAC. He's typing on a UK keyboard. Us American folks don't really understand what uh, a lot of these keys are, but oh well. Like, where's the pipe? Okay, I don't know if he'll be able to pick it up. Now I'm going to be tunneling. Hopefully this is going to work. About two days ago, I plugged this NIC into a, into a Cisco VoIP port which I think might have fried it. So it worked this morning. It, it's flaky. I'll tell you that much. But hopefully this is going to work. OK. Typing Linux commands with the stylus isn't always the easiest. What's interesting about tunneling over UDP port 53, I don't know how many of you all road warriors, but uh, the STSN systems, I've noticed will allow you to tunnel home with SIP, uh, and they don't seem to pick it up on the bill for some reason. So if you do do that, let them know that you're using the network. Uh, not only not only the STN system, STSN systems, but also the Wayport access at airports, as well as the T-Mobile access. But you should definitely use these ethically um, rather than illegitimately. Legally, I should say. And illegitimately. Yeah. yeah. So do we, do we have a VPN? I am about to turn this on. In the window in the lower left-hand corner up there, um, that's the output of the log files. Stuff should start flying up on the screen if this, actually, if this uh, works.
takes a while, it boots, it uh, figures out which ports it can get on. It's figuring out that it's being denied on, uh, on, the, on the TCP ports. It's figuring out that it uh, cannot get out on the ICMP. And the link light just turned off. Yeah, it's been off. Let's let that hover, and we'll go to the grand finale. Yeah, we're going to let Aaron do the uh, do the uh, PPP over SSH over uh, proxy tunnel. Okay, so the idea now is he's going to change the firewall while the IPAC figures out where it's at. Uh, what's going to happen is the idea is someone goes into an organization, they drops off this CD here, and it will try to figure out what it can get out on the network. And the idea is it's not going to be able to get out on any TCP ports, CDP ports, or ICMP, and then it's going to have to try to find a proxy to phone home. Once it does that, it's going to have to establish uh, an SSH connection over the proxy and keep that going, and then it's going to have to run PPP on top of that. And then it'll have to actually have to send its routes to the uh, phone home server, which is Chris's, so the VPN can be established. Uh, luckily, I have VMware here, so I don't have to have a third laptop just to do this one. So I'm going to power it on and put it in full screen and see how this, re uh, this projector reacts to that. Okay, this is just the standard Trinix booting. If you can get like a ping ready for this guy. And it's un, uh, un storing its packages. It's figuring out, uh, it's, it's untarring PPP. Now it's kicking off the scripts, which happens really fast over this local network. It figures out all of its network information, what its IP is, what its mail exchanger is, if it wanted to mail something. Um, it's DNS name. Now it's checking which ports it can get out on. It failed on TCP, it failed on UDP, it failed on ICMP. It's kicking off the last process, which is the proxy finder. Uh, it's trying to find open proxies, and it made a list of them in the root directory. And it found one named proxy. Imagine that. Um, and what it's doing is it's starting PPP over SSH uh, over proxy tunnel. So. If you can look over over here, we we saw a bunch of output in this window a second ago. This is the SSH daemon accepting the uh, the authentication and the PPP daemon starting up. Up in the upper right hand corner, uh, upper right hand window, I've got a ping over the virtual network, which is the 10.0.3.0 network. As you can see, the ICMP packets are scrolling by. The interesting thing about this, and, and we haven't determined why exactly, but the ping times drop and drop and drop and drop by about 20 milliseconds a piece until it hits about two milliseconds in a, in, a, in a return time. And then it jumps up to 12 milliseconds and then keeps doing that again. It's, it's interesting behavior for this type of, type of thing. So right here, that's our PPP interface. Basically, what we've built is a, a full VPN that both sides can access that works over PPP, that works over SSH, that works on top of the proxy server that it was able to find and discover and build the network home. And it's pretty stable. What we found out is if you leave a process like top running, that it will stay up for two or three days, or at least until they reboot the proxy server. Uh, in this case, we're using Squid on this laptop, but it works over Microsoft Proxy. It works over any proxy that has the connect feature, which is basically all of them. And then I think Chris may be trying one last time on the iPad. He just unblocked UDP, and the link light's on. That's positive. Link light is on. just dropped again. <laughs> well, now it's back on. When I said flaky, I meant flaky. Use the Dreamcast. It's cheaper. 
Well, you want to just let it do its thing? Yeah. If it's it comes on, we'll let you know. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely point it out if it comes on. So those are the demos that we had. Um, in, in summary, we were able to establish virtual networks, not always private, depending on your encryption scheme and whether or not you have one at all. Um, we established virtual networks to a home box by testing what, port what protocols were authorized to traverse the firewall um, and by dynamically initiating those connections uh, based upon what's available. So as we said earlier, uh, we're going to hopefully provide some uh, remediations to this. Uh, the, the, the biggest thing that we can recommend uh, when trying to defend against this attack is that network design should not try to prevent. Prevention in this, in this case is, is, is near impossible, but instead constrict the data paths on, out of your network to well-defined interfaces. Um, try to use more proxies, even though we did show, show a flaw in a, in, a, in a proxy path, it is a single point of exit through your network, whether it's a HTTP proxy, email proxy, DNS forwarding, um, so on and so, so forth. Uh, one thing we kind of threw this in here, uh, the, ne the next bullet, we kind of threw this in here as hopes that maybe somebody would pick up the ball, uh, take, take over with PGP net left off and actually try to make a full, net, full mesh VPN, maybe some bulk encryption. Uh, that would prevent drop and go hardware if every endpoint has to be authenticated with one another, but again, that's only drop and go hardware. If you deliver this through a zero day exploit, it's, you're again relying on a trusted mechanism. Um, we would recommend switchboard security, again, a prevention against uh, drop-and-go hardware. It's a pain to do. You've got to collect all those MAC addresses and keep track of them. And when somebody from HR wants to move over to accounting, you've got to make sure that they fill out the right forms, which doesn't happen. Um, but, you have to, but it would be a good effort to go ahead and try to do that, there, thereby preventing people from plugging into the network. Right. Um, just keeping unauthorized devices off the network is 90% is of the battle. Oh, yeah. Um, would love would love to see a super fine granular IDS. Would love to see an IDS that knows your network better than you do, that knows what data should be on your network, that, that reduces the number of variables in, in internet and network transmissions down to uh, down to just a few. Because right now there are hundreds of thousands of them. There are just too many. Um, it, but if we could reduce that down to a few and be able to just check against those, that would be wonderful. Uh, protocol analyzing proxies, as I, as I said earlier, EX, exe renamed to text files, you know, it passes through, but what if the proxy actually analyzes your XML content? What if it analyzes your web content, your streaming media content? It's hard to do. I don't know if they're going to do it, but it would be great to see. Um, if that is that your single egress point through your network, you should be checking the content of the data passing by. <coughs> In addition, one thing that we didn't demonstrate here. Um, Which we should have, because this network card works beautifully. Oh yeah, the, the Orinoco cards and the IPACs work like a champ. Um, but what if you do have an air gap in your network? What if it's not even plugged in anywhere? Well, you go the wireless route. You plug, you plug a, you know, your Ethernet port in to their network, it configures itself, sets up, the, sets up the NAT rule sets on here so that you can sit outside their parking lot on a wireless link and be able to hack their network. We did some tinkering around with, with that. I mean, that's kind of an expensive access point when you think about it. But uh, we, we did some interesting things to prove a point. Uh, one of the solution that we heard from a client was, well, why don't you, we have a policy where we look for, we use AirSnort and we use uh, NetStumbler to find rogue access points on our network. But we, we figured out a way to engineer this to only turn the radio device on when we tell it to. So we set it to a cron job and we say, okay, well, good, you search for your uh, network access points, but this one turns on automatically at 2 a.m. on a Sunday when you're not war driving your own company, when you're not running uh, air snort. So that was uh, something to think about. And wireless jamming, uh, w whether it's legal or ethical or if it even exists, uh, that may be the only real way to stop someone from just ordering a Linksys WAP and plugging it into your network. Um, the problem is we still, at the end of the day, we have to let outbound traffic, we have to allow something to get out. I mean, we talked a little bit about using a reverse DNX, DNS proxy. Well, what if an attacker wrote a proxy server that basically did the two parts of the network connection, and depending on which, uh, which name it looked up, that was an actual information for the packet. Uh, there, the, at some point, we do have to let outbound traffic, and it only takes someone with a lot of time on their hands to figure out exactly a way to build covert channels out. 
We've seen some simple attacks with uh, Telnet over SMTP or, or, or things like that. Uh, today we, we uh, wanted to show you actual full VPNs over those protocols. Um, another thing that's making this a little more uh, difficult to tackle is the fact that these devices are small and they're getting smaller. There's a PC-104 architecture which is embedded Linux computers that, that are very small and they're more than capable of uh, doing all the attacks that we presented today. In fact, we will probably be developing something on those uh, shortly with a microphone uh, on the system that will send a voice uh, over the network via a tunnel. It's, it, the, essentially, with as small as they are, you can make a wireless, uh, not, I'm sorry, not a wireless, but a small bug that you can put in somebody's, somebody's place and use their network to get the information out. So even if they do have a wireless scanner, a bug finder, they're not going to find it because it's not emitting any, uh, any, any frequencies. Um, the PC-104 architecture is also only three inch square. Um, and they make even smaller, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the uh, SO DIMMs that actually have uh, full, fully functional, com basically full, fully functional computer architecture on the DIMM itself. Another problem with prevent or, or keeping this attack at bay is the person who does this isn't your normal person who sits at home and wants to hack random systems on the internet. They, if, they're, if they're going to go to the lengths of actually obtaining physical access, they've probably done some type of reconnaissance, some type of uh, information gathering about your organization, which makes them a, a more dangerous attacker. Um, another, another the, the point what we, what we want to get across today is that we've done a lot of good work on the perimeter and we've done a lot of we've made a lot of progress on uh, on watching those external attacks and thwarting those external attacks but we've all kind of known that the, the inside is is something that that can come around to bite us and we, we do our best to make an attempt at it but we're hoping that it's taken a, a little more seriously and that uh, that uh, that people will start paying more attention because that's really where the data is it's worth protecting I mean the focus has to be given the, the, the focus of information security isn't on your perimeter, isn't on your network devices, it's on the data you, you, that's contained within. It, and that's really the point we're trying to make today, is that getting at that data is fairly easy for multiple vantage points. And so mechanisms that actually can protect that data are, would be worth their weight in gold. Okay, here's some links. Those are printed up for you. They're also on the website. We're going to have all this stuff available. We wanted people to come up and play with it and check it out uh, after the talk. Uh, we also want to give you guys a good uh, head start to lunch so, uh, so it doesn't all get eaten. Uh, but right now we'd like to uh, open it up for some Q&A. Yes, sir. Are you right. talking through the PAC protocol? Right. Um, that's, uh, the, the question that was asked was um, for, for host-based uh, attacks where we can drop something into a host, um, can we use um, the, the data already contained on that host to further our efforts so that we don't have to do all this discovery? It's already sitting there for us. And the, and the answer is yes. Um, in our initial design, we didn't, we didn't incorporate the PAC protocol into, into our design. We didn't, I mean, everything is standalone right now. Right. And so taking advantage of those capabilities that a host already has, uh, we couldn't do. However, if you do have an auto-run Windows CD that you can drop into a computer and it does have proxy settings enabled, there, there's, there's how you do it. Another thing that we've noticed when testing this is finding a proxy server is really easy. They're not, they're not hidden. Uh, you, you want what your, your IT wants to tell people. It's proxy.company.com, not some obscure uh, domain name. Yeah. Question? Sure. Yeah, um, why do you use the Windows CD? Wouldn't you be better off like writing some 32 executable, putting it on like a sales guy's desk, it backdoors the box, you have all the settings, you have valid IPs, MAC address, you can, you know, you know everything that's going in and out. If you need to run Unix commands, you can even have like SQL on there. The question was, why not um, have just code? Why why create a bootable CD-ROM? Why not just have code that can hack the box, can can get the get the appropriate information? Is, is that proper rephrasing? Um, the the answer to that is that's entirely possible. We're limited in what we can develop within a two-month time span. Um, for for ease of implementation as well as ease of demonstration, we decided to use um, just a bootable CD-ROM. I'm a right. Unix guy. I'm not a Windows guy. I, I think I'm the only thing I know how to code in Windows is. 
I don't know, not, a script. Not to mention, I think the way it was envisioned was not necessarily for Bob's PC because, you know, what's he going to do when he comes in the next day? He's going to see the CD in his drive, which has got our IPs hard-coded on it, phoning home. Uh, I guess the idea would be more of those kiosks-type systems or, or, or systems that are in open areas that are, are used, like the printer station or the <coughs> scanner station, uh, but, but not necessarily someone's PC, although it wouldn't be that hard to, to do exactly what you said, which is a good idea and some, something we may end up doing. The, there are many avenues by which to deploy this. Um, the, the more you can think of and the more you want to spend time implementing, the better. Um, it's pretty much wide open as to how you deliver this because, as we said earlier, it's based on a delivery mechanism. Once you have that delivery mechanism, the rest of the attack takes place. Yeah. That would be a, a great idea as well because then you don't have to hang out in the parking lot, right? Well, that that's some good uh, 180 degree hacking. Right, and it the size would. too helps. And what's a nice thing about the iPack is the battery pack too, which gives you a few more hours to play around with. Just for, for those on the side of the room, the question was why not use a, a GSM phone in the back of the iPack instead of a wireless card or an Ethernet card? And that's, that's, completely, that's completely understandable and, and a good yeah. idea as well. Um, as long as you have transport, no matter what medium it is, that's all the better. You had a question? No, no, no. Okay, sorry about that. Sure, go ahead. Um, obviously, this is stacked based on port based firewalls. Do application based, based firewalls um, have any added advantage? <coughs> Um, that is that is a constriction measure because you are limiting the data paths. Um, port based, I mean, it's it's not <coughs> thorough or comprehensive enough to really tell uh, analyze the data. Whereas application based firewall is able to analyze that data. Um, however, we are relying on trusted protocols. So if your application firewall does does uh, HTTP and it allows that through, we can embed that HTTP, uh, we can embed the network data in the HTTP traffic. In, in fact, if you'd like firewall. to come up after, uh, we, we can dump the traffic, and what's neat about proxy tunnel and HTTP tunnel is, it is, it's acting like the application. It's saying, hi, I'm this browser, I want to get this data. Question? Just stretching? Yes. If uh, the proxy is not authenticating the proxy, this will not work? One of the, the, the question was if the proxy is an authenticating proxy, will, will it not work? At the current state, no. Um, you know, we don't necessarily claim to have fully functional devices. We're given a proof of concept right. here. Like but on every done. one of these systems, sorry to interrupt, there is, there's DSNF and FOSS uh, sniffer, which is capable of picking up that basic authentication. But uh, we can we could try to replay that authentication once sniffed. It just requires more intelligence, more coding, to, to actually get, capture that data. Yes. On some of the devices like the, the iPad or the Dreamcast, are you limited as far as once the tunnel is connected? Are you limited to the type of packs you then stage on the software center based on on those devices? It, it depends on your point of presence. If you're, if you're coming from the mothership box or the network that's connected to the mothership box, what we do is when we establish the tunnel, we create two points of net network address translation. Really, it's just masquerading because we only have one IP. But it's masqueraded going into the tunnel, masqueraded on the other end. It's easier that way since we don't have to pass route information back and forth. Um, we don't want to run RIP or, or any of the other routing protocols over, the, over this. And so since we have that dually routed connection, we can do anything you can do over a masqueraded connection. Of course, you're not going to be able to do sniffing of the local network unless, of course, you SSH or Telnet to the, to the attack tool, uh, to, the, to the device, and actually do, the, uh, do those attacks on this device. Any type of uh, ARP spoofing, Mac, uh, poisoning attacks, you're not going to be able to do from a remote perspective. But yeah, you could, you could get onto this system through the tunnel and uh, actually perform those attacks. That might be it. If that's it, we invite anyone who wants to come up uh, to check it out to do so. Thank you very much for coming today.